So we're going to go ahead and get started. So a um, little bit about myself. My name is Crystal May. Um, I started on the medical billing side of things. So I did certified coding and billing for many specialties from OBGYN to family practice to um, surgery centers and really loved what I was doing and, and loved being in the medical side of things. But I had an opportunity about 15 years ago to get into dentistry. I uh, found that dentistry was a better fit for me. Um, I really found a passion there in, in helping patients. And really quickly, I saw that we were doing procedures every day that could be billed to medical insurance. And so within the first oh, six months of, of being in that practice, we started billing medical insurance for certain procedures and, and really saw how it could, could change our practice and the lives of our patients. Uh, then about 10 years ago, I took my first sleep course and I really found uh, my true passion, uh, which was dental sleep medicine. And we, we came back from the course and decided we were going to implement sleep into our practice and spend $10,000 on sleep test machines and a stack of, of documents and forms and, and said, let's, let's do this. And um, it took us almost five years to be successful in that implementation. So it, it wasn't easy. Um, we were a pretty... Um, pretty organized office. We were pretty good at protocols and implementation, and it still took us nearly five years to, to see success with that. And so once we figured it out and we kind of answered all those questions, we decided that um, we wanted to build solutions for dentistry and share these opportunities with other practices so that you didn't have to go through the same struggles and battles that we did in our practices. And so we've taken both medical billing and sleep medicine and we've done just that. So um, we've uh, developed a company called DevDent, stands for Developing Dentistry, and we're all about innovation um, and improving patient care. So um, we are offering education, software, and su support to dental practices to help them implement things in their practices that can strengthen their practice and improve the lives of their patients. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about DevDent and some of the services we offer throughout this webinar. So, Again, the title was Truth About Medical Billing, so I wanted to kind of identify some of the myths that I hear in dentistry about medical billing and kind of try to put some of those um, in the correct path here. So um, I'm constantly um, told when I talk to a new practice that they don't believe that they can bill dental insurance as a general dentist because only specialists can. So that is absolutely not correct. Um, anybody with a DDS, DMD, MD, or DO, um, now we have PAs and, and um, other specialties as well, can perform medical procedures that fall under the scope of their license. Of course, some states and federal rules do apply, but for the most part, dentists can bill for what they are licensed to do. So a dentist performing a bone graft uses the exact same procedure code as a plastic surgeon performing a bone graft. So it's not a dental specific code, the code is specific to the location in the body, and in this case it would be the oral cavity. But also an oral surgeon uses the exact same extraction code or procedure code as a general dentist. So um, we need to just to get that out of our heads that because we're not specialized that for some reason that limits what we can bill. Um, a lot of offices think that surgeons can bill medical insurance because of their specialty, and that's not true. Um, it's just they're more familiar with it because a lot of the procedures that they're doing aren't covered by dental insurance, so they've kind of been forced to be first in the industry. So we all use one set of codes. Um, another myth is that you can't bill medical insurance for dental procedures. Um, and I'm gonna really go into detail on this topic um, and, and try to help you understand why that is not the case and what we can bill for. So we use the statement, what can you bill for? Everything. It's not about the procedure code, it's about the, the why, the diagnosis code, why are you doing it? So there is a medical cross code for every single procedure that we do in dentistry. No exception. So if, if you are doing a procedure, there is a medical equivalent or cross code. They don't care what you're doing. They care why you're doing it. So big difference between medical insurance and dental insurance is dental insurance requires just a procedure code. We just have to tell them what treatment we provided. In medical, we have to tell them what treatment we provided, but why? What's the diagnosis code? So we have to add that additional documentation. So if we can prove that the why the diagnosis is medically related, then we would be having that procedure considered a medical. So it's all about medical necessity. So um, example that I love is I've even had veneers covered in my practice with the use of long-term tetracycline use. So they took a medication, which is obviously medical, and it caused damage to teeth that was irreversible. And the only treatment recommendation we had was veneers. So um, 
again, what can you bill for? Everything. There is a procedure code for everything we do in dentistry. So to make it a little easier, our company has broken it down into six categories. And um, if you ever hear us teach or present, you're gonna hear us go, go through these six categories in, in great detail. Um, in the small time we have here, I can't do it in a lot of detail, but I wanted to at least open your eyes to what the possibilities are um, and kind of see what could be billed to medical insurance and, and how might that change your patient's um, experience or your practice's bottom line. First and foremost in category one was exams and x-rays or radiographs. Um, we start here because it's one of the easier things to bill. Um, exams, we're talking about billing medical insurance when you see a patient for a medical reason. So if you have a patient who is diabetic and needs to be seen more regularly for an oral evaluation because you need to make sure that we're staying on top of the care, you could bill a medical exam for that. If you're seeing a patient that has um, certain other certain disorders like maybe they have a dementia or Alzheimer's and, and they need to have more regular care anything like that that has a medical correlation can be billed to the medical insurance as an exam of course a nice thing about this is there's no limitations or frequencies so in dentistry we're constantly running out of exams we've already used all of our periodic or comprehensive exams for the whole year and medical doesn't have a maximum or frequency limitation for exams so great opportunity here they even give us fees we can add on to our exams for after hours and emergency care. So we can even add to our exams. In this category, we also um, educate on how to bill for all of your radiographs. So CBCT, PANO, bite wings, PAs, FMXs, anything to do with radiographs can be billed to medical if you're doing the, the image for a medical reason. Um, so I'll give you a few more examples, but if you're taking a PANO because you're doing an oral cancer screening, we can bill medical for that. If you're doing a pano because you're suspicious, you're suspicious that there might be sinus involvement or maybe there's a possibly an impacted tooth, impacted teeth are actually a medical condition because the body didn't uh, develop or form the way it was supposed to. So abscesses, infections, those are the types of procedures we would look for. So here's a few examples, and I'll show these throughout the webinar. Um, we do have a third-party billing company. It's called Imagine Billing. And I wanted to show you what it looks like when you use our service. So you'll see on the left-hand side, several entries, um, the 13th, the 14th, the 19th, and so on. Each one of those is the correspondence between our billing company and the insurance company. So you submit to us what you did, and then we submit to the insurance company along with all the documentation and requirements to get it paid. Um, we also do all the aging and follow-up. So if the claim is denied or the claim is in a, in, is a, in a stall, then we're the ones calling and aging it. So we take away that burden for your team to be on the phone with those insurance companies. But one of the things we do hear a lot is that you tried to bill medical insurance that wasn't successful and you waited years to get your claims paid, if ever. Um, so this is just an example that is pretty unusual. I won't say it's common, but this claim was paid um, nine days after submission excuse me, six days after submission. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, we don't get that turnaround time in, in dentistry, but also notice that um, it's, an, it's a new patient office visit. So this was a patient we hadn't seen for medical before. Um, the practice billed out $250. The insurance company allowed 124 and they wrote a check to the provider for $84. So the patient had a $40 copay, just like they would if they would have seen a medical doctor in this case. So you might say, well, my patients are used to having their exams paid at 100%. Now they have to pay a $40 copay. That's absolutely true. This, once you work and go into the medical side of things, you're gonna be treated like a medical provider and copays for office visits will apply. A couple things. When's the last time you received $124 for an office visit? And I would venture to say never. Um, so you're getting a more appropriate compensation for your time, but also what if they were already out of the exam benefits? Uh, what if you did an exam here and now they don't have exam visits for periodics or limited? At that point, they're paying at least $40 out of pocket to you for those exams, not to mention you're only getting that lower reimbursement. So um, this is an exam example. I just wanted to show you some codes. The codes alone are really a small part of medical billing, but I wanted to show you how the cross codes work. So on the left-hand side here, you'll see the CPT code, which is the medical procedure code, and then you'll see the, the cross code or CDT code for the dental code. So for a CBCT, um, you would 
potentially use the D code right now, um, D0367. And if you cross code it, it goes over to 70486. So I just provided you some examples of the FMX and PANO as well. Now on the right hand side are the ICD-10 diagnosis codes. So these are the, the why, this is the medical diagnosis. So these are just a few examples of why images may be covered. So jaw pain, if the patient comes in pain and you need to determine why, it's likely you're going to need to take an x-ray. If the patient has bone loss, you need to determine how much bone loss. If you think about bone loss differently and forget about it being a missing tooth or in the oral cavity, you can see that bone loss is definitely a medical condition. If you had atrophy of bone anywhere else in your body, they would certainly consider it a medical condition. And then you see the impacted teeth and the cellulitis. But another one um, that is commonly covered is abnormal radiographic findings. And this just means that you took an x-ray, maybe a bite wing, and you saw something abnormal and you needed a better image. So you, you went on to take the PANO or the, the CBCT or even the PA. <clears throat> and you could use abnormal findings there. Again, I said this is one of my favorite or first categories to start with because we're getting denials from dental. CBCTs are not getting paid by dental insurance. FMXs and PANOs are starting to be five to seven year frequency limitations. Um, even though we know how valuable they can be in detecting things as early as possible, but we're also getting really low allowables on this really expensive equipment. So if we build medical insurance for these procedures, and they pay them, we're, we're taking out the dental side, but we're also getting to charge our full fee. So you're no longer subject to your PPO fee schedules because you're billing medical, not dental. And then of course, I mentioned the frequency limitation. The fact that you can only take um, a particular x-ray as often as the insurance company tells you to is a problem. If the doctor needs to take an x-ray, the doctor should take the x-ray. Um, huge fan of CBCT. We present and teach that CBCT will be the standard of care. In our courses, we show you how to implement comb beam technology into your daily workflow. We talk about it from a sleep perspective and how it can be used as an airway analysis, but it's an expensive piece of equipment that dental insurance isn't paying for. So if you have a CBCT machine, it's, a, it's kind of a no brainer that you should be looking at medical insurance, even if just to start with your CBCT. Here's some um, EOBs for CBCT. They allowed 300, paid 100% at 300. Um, here's another one that was ran through Imagine Billing. This is an office visit and a CBCT that were both um, ran through. Again, time frame was very, very fast. You see all of the different colored boxes on the right-hand side. That's all the interactions it took between us and the insurance company to get them to pay. Um, but you'll see that this one has a higher allowable. They allowed $600 for that CBCT and paid 580. We do offer a service to help you do a fee analysis to see where your fees should be. Um, we do that by um, taking an inventory of your common payers in your area and then analyzing the fee schedules that we have access to. But realistically, you set a fee that you're comfortable with collecting from your patient. So if you're not comfortable collecting $600 from your patient for every comb beam, you shouldn't be billing medical insurance $600 either. Most of our customers charge between two and $300 for their CBCTs. Second category was screening and diagnostic services. So this is a little bit of a catch-all, but this is where we're gonna do all of our perio, this is where all of our screenings are going to be. So our oral cancer, if you're doing blood sugar or if you're doing saliva testing, uh, smoking cessation and Botox all fall within this category. We did an analysis of a number of practices um, and we kind of followed them through hygiene and new patient to see what types of services they were providing during that, those procedures. And everything above the blue line is what they're doing and charging for and everything below the blue line are the things that they're doing for free. Uh, so that's an that's a unfortunate situation in dentistry that we have a tendency to only bill for the things covered by dental insurance. And if you get into medical billing, we can kind of change your mentality here and you could actually bill for the time you spend with these patients on these other topics like oral cancer um, screenings using a tool like a Velscope or a Visalite. Um, if you're doing any of your nutritional counseling or oral hygiene instruction, those can be billed out here. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you start by um, charging nutritional counseling for every hygiene patient because um, it would be a lot of work for very little reimbursement. But what I do suggest you do is start putting the procedures you're doing on the patient's ledger right now. So zero them out. There's an ADA code for all of these procedures. And when your hygienist is doing nutritional counseling or oral um, hygiene instruction, 
those should be on the ledger, even if they're zero. Because as time progresses and you get more and more into medical billing, you'll see the opportunity to start billing medical for those. And your patients won't be so surprised when they went from having everything covered by dental and it was only five procedures to now they're getting a, you know, a statement that might have eight procedures on it. So huge opportunity to change your bottom line though. The revenue potential there is pretty big. So myth three, periodontal treatment can't be billed to medical insurance. It absolutely can. It's just all about the why. So if I'm a patient with one five millimeter bleeding pocket and I need one to three teeth, that's not gonna be covered by medical insurance if I'm a fairly healthy patient especially. What is gonna be covered by medical insurance is your SRP and your Restin or your laser treatment, your LANAP, whatever surgeries you're doing for perio when the patient has a comorbidity or a supporting medical condition. So my two favorites to start with are pregnancy and diabetes. So we all know that the evidence that links pregnancy risks and the risk to the fetus even back to periodontal diseases is, is, can't be argued. And so if we can have a show a patient is pregnant, we can actually bill their perio treatment to their medical insurance. Um, I'm not talking about it a lot in this presentation, but deductibles are something that are going to come up, um, and I'll be doing another webinar on that topic. But if you have a patient who's pregnant, there's no one more likely to meet their deductible than a pregnant patient. Uh, so what an opportunity to, to get potentially their staving and root planning covered at no cost to them if they've reached their out-of-pocket maximum. Same thing is true with type 2 diabetics very expensive disease to have. Um, it's very common for type 2 diabetics to have met their deductible early on in the year. And we all know the correlation between diabetes and periodontal diseases is, is um, not arguable. So when you have a patient that comes in that has one of those two conditions, you can right away be thinking, hey, th this is a perio opportunity. Once you get further into medical billing, we'll show you other situations like Alzheimer's or dementia patients, patients who have um, limitations uh, with dexterity, those types of patients can potentially be billed as well. But can a dentist diagnose a patient with the pre as pregnant? Absolutely not. Can a dentist diagnose a patient with type 2 diabetes? Absolutely not. So if you're treating a patient and the main diagnosis code is a medical condition, we need to get that medical code from their medical doctor. You do not have to get it in writing and you don't have to talk to the doctor themselves you need to document the phone call. So typical in our practice would be, um, we'd have a patient come in who is pregnant with perio, we'd get the name of their OB, we'd call and speak to someone in the nursing or medical records department and say we have a mutual patient, we're treating them for perio disease, we need their diagnosis code for their pregnancy. They would give us the code and they'll just list it off. We put that we talked to nurse Sue and this is the code they gave and that's all the documentation you need for scaling and root planning. But it doesn't just stop at the SRP, it also moves on to their um, perio maintenance and ongoing treatment as well. So um, keep a really open mind when you think about scaling and root planing. Here's an example of scaling and root planing. Um, this one took up almost 30 days to get paid. Um, we had to resubmit and send additional information, just like dental insurance. We submit claims and they say it's not on file, even though we have proof, right? So it's not, this isn't going to be any different, but we just have to age it really aggressively. So that's what our billing team will do for you. But this was $1,100. They allowed the full $1,100 and they paid the provider $720. The patient may have actually paid you less if you were billing dental insurance in this case, but the patient would be completely out of dental benefits because you would have used their maximum just to have their SRP paid. So if they needed any restorative work done or even their perio maintenance, they may be completely out of pocket for all other treatment um, because you billed dental for this procedure. So we also have to consider even though it might cost the patient a little bit more on the actual procedure of the scaling and root planing, overall treatment may be considerably less expensive if we can save those precious dental benefits for dental specific procedures. So it's always my suggestion to go medical first and you can always build dental if medical doesn't pay. So here's an um, EOB for perio maintenance. Um, this one is uh, perio exam and x-ray. They allowed 237, they paid 237 at 100%. So you, they're getting their office visits and again, and their x-rays. So just another example of what that would look like. 
Now, I mentioned one of my favorite topics is sleep, so I'm going to spend just a little more time on this category. But during in this category, it's all things appliances. Um, so this is going to be your obstructive sleep apnea appliances, your occlusal guards, your TMD. If any of you are treating pediatric development or habit corrections, there's devices there. Uh, we've even had um, clear aligners paid uh, for medically necessary ortho. So um, ortho is a little tricky. Um, so I don't suggest you start there, but there is an opportunity, especially with complicated ortho cases, to bill medical for that. So the ADA released a statement a few years ago that said every dentist should be addressing um, sleep-related breathing disorders um, or obstructive sleep apnea in their patients. And, and it's, it was call, calling for an action that dentists should be looking at medical histories, looking inside the mouth, and identifying their risk factors. So in essence, they're saying every dentist should be screening for sleep disorders in their existing patient base. Now, if you don't want to treat sleep, that's just fine. There's nothing that says you need to or have to do that. But it's no different than if you don't remove third molars, you still identify them and refer. That's what the ADA is asking of dentists with sleep, is identify those that are at risk and refer when appropriate. So um, it depends on what your practice looks like, where you're at, um, how many dentists, how much chair time, even the demographic of insurance and patient base. So um, implementing sleep isn't right for every practice. But most offices, when they dig down to it, realize implementing sleep into their own practice really has a lot of upside to it. So I'll show you just a few things with that. So a dentist, myth four, can a dentist, or a dentist can diagnose a patient with sleep apnea. Any of you who've ever taken a course or know anything about sleep at all know that that is not true. You must have a board certified specialist do your interpretation. So again, outside of your scope of license, so a dentist isn't trained to diagnose the patient with sleep apnea. So the suggestion we have is that the patient wears a home sleep test in their own home. They can wear it for one, two, even three nights. That data is stored on a computer, um, which is, worn, is part of the sleep test. And then they bring it back to you and you upload it to a portal where it's sent to a board certified sleep specialist to analyze the data, read it, and then they send you back a prescription and diagnosis so that you're ready to treat the patient. So never would a dentist be able to bypass this step if you're truly treating the patient for a sleep disorder. So the insurance company is gonna require a copy of the home sleep test, a copy of the actual diagnosis, the interpretation, and the prescription that says that this patient is appropriately being treated with an oral appliance. So those are the steps necessary. Now, some states don't um, encourage dentists to do their own sleep testing. Um, it's, there's other ways to get a patient tested as well, but we know that if you refer a patient to a specialist to go spend the night in an in-lab study, the likelihood of them following through that process is really low. And so by offering the home sleep test in your own practice, you've just taken away some obstacles for your patients so that they can get tested quicker, um, get diagnosed faster, and treated faster, which is obviously the goal. Now, we do provide the network of board-certified specialists to our customers for these interpretations. So you don't have to go out and make these relationships right off the get-go. You can use our network to get started. And then as you become more fluent in sleep and it becomes a bigger part of your practice, then we can always help you find a local specialist to have them do your interpretations if you choose to do that. So billing for sleep is actually quite simple. Um, these are some of the examples of what you could bill for. You could bill for the office visit. You could bill for the CBCT. Maybe we're doing an airway analysis. You can bill for the home sleep test, although I don't strongly encourage you to bill medical for the home sleep test because they often require pre-authorization and can slow down the process. Um, we recommend that you just have a cash price for your home sleep test, but there is a code for it. And then the custom appliance is the code you'll use. And, then, and that's the code you'll use whether um, the patient is a severe patient, no matter the type of appliance you're using, we always use this E0486. And then we have to have the diagnosis code. And again, this is a code a dentist cannot diagnose themselves. So we've gotten this from a MD or specialist in this case. Um, so here are some EOBs for sleep. Sleep gets a really good rep for the, the ROI, for the, the potential for practice growth, because um, the average allowable nationwide today is about $2,500. So uh, this, across the board, um, you're getting about $2,500 in allowable for an oral appliance. 
Um, so in this case, it was 3,000, they paid it 95%, so you got a check for 2850 and you collected the difference, the $150 difference from the patient. Um, here's another uh, myth that I really wanna make sure that you take this one away with you. Um, you can charge an increased fee to the insurance company and write off the unpaid portion. That is not true. So I use this as an example. This practice um, is billing $8,000 for every sleep appliance. The insurance company is allowing $7,200, and then they're getting a check in the mail for $5,760. So what they're doing is they're adjusting the difference. They're taking $5,760 as payment in full, because who wouldn't think that that's appropriate? We all think that's enough. So they're taking that 5760 and they're writing off the difference of 2240 and they're not making the patient pay anything. That is insurance fraud. So if you're billing the insurance company, you must collect the patient's deductibles and coinsurances. Um, so it's really important when you set your fees to consider what amount are you willing to collect from your patient. So let's say you billed $7,200 and the patient had a $5,000 deductible you would be required by law to collect that $5,000 deductible from that patient. And if your patient was, had a different expectation and was thinking they'd pay nothing or very little, now you have a, a really tough situation with your patient. So I'm a huge fan of charging a fee for an appliance that patients can afford. And I would rather see you help five patients a month at $2,000 than one patient every six months at $10,000, because that's the reality. Patients don't think these oral appliances are worth $10,000. And even me, with the passion I have, I don't think they're worth $10,000. So um, just be careful. If any billing company is telling you that your fees can fluctuate and change from um, insurance to patient or payer to payer, um, you, you want to look into that. Um, certainly not worth being um, fined or audited with some fraud penalties. Here's another oral appliance. Um, again, you'll see on the right-hand side, there's a lot of activity it took us to get this one paid. We still got it paid in less than 30 days, but each one of those colored boxes is us working through this with the insurance company. This one, the insurance, the office charged $6,500. The allowable was $1,950 and the provider paid $1,850. So don't get the idea that just because you charge more, you're going to get more. Whatever the allowable is set by the insurance company, it is what it is. And it doesn't matter that you charge 6,000 or 3,000, they were only going to allow 1950 no matter how you did it. But again, as a patient, I'm not super pleased to get an EOB for $6,500, uh, loud amount at 1950, that feels a little, bit, um, a little bit questionable as a patient. Are you trying to maybe pull one over on me? So keep in mind when you set your fees. So TMD, this is still kind of a gray world. Medical thinks it's dental, dental thinks it's medical. Uh, it's kind of a frustrating thing, but we are seeing success with TMD appliances. So again, you could bill for the office visit, you could bill for the comb beam if you're analyzing the jaw joint, you could bill for the actual orthotic device if you needed to do diagnostic cast, um, you could bill for that. And then there's even a code to do appliance adjustments. So if you need to adjust the appliance periodically um, outside of the global period, you can bill for that. So there's a lot of TMD codes. Um, there's bilateral, unilateral, there's anterior displaced discs, there's all kinds of different details in TMJ. So your doctor will have to choose the appropriate code. Um, we offer some assistance in that with some materials and some um, encounter forms. So um, if you're using our encounter form, we'll actually have a TMD encounter form and the doctor gets all the options available um, for TMD and he or she just selects the ones that apply to that patient. So, and then jaw pain. Almost all of our TMD patients are experiencing pain. So we'll add that on as a secondary code as well. Here's an EOB. Um, this is a, a pretty new customer of ours. They just came on earlier this year. Um, again, you can see they're billing $10,000 for their TMD appliance. The insurance company is only allowing just under $900. They're paying it at 60% um, based off of a deductible. So in this case, the patient had a $300 deductible and a $20 or a $60 coinsurance. So um, had that patient already met their deductible, they would only owe $60 for this procedure. But if the alternative is to pay cash, 
as a patient, I'm still thrilled, right, that you saved me $539 in this case. But I'm going to caution you from having your fee be so much higher than you're willing to collect from your patient. I mean, a $9,100 write-off is, is pretty drastic here. So, so be aware of that. Um, but TMD, definitely an option. If you're doing a lot of TMD, a lot of occlusal guards, um, even if you don't consider yourself a TMD practice or TMJ practice, um, there's probably an opportunity to look at medical. Dental's not paying for them. Patients need the care, so there's an opportunity there. Trauma is probably one of the easiest categories to bill for. Those of you who have kind of maybe stuck your toe in the water a little here have probably started with accidents and trauma. The great thing about this category is they pay for everything related to that procedure or injury. So if the patient needs to have a flipper done and they need to have um, internal whitening and they have exams and x-rays, they need to come back for more exams and x-rays and then you need to do some casting and then you need some digital photography and maybe you need some additional um, x-rays you know, throughout the healing process as you will during an implant procedure, everything can be billed to medical related to that trauma. So the earlier you can get started down that trauma path, the better for the patient. So if the first time that patient walks in, you can identify them as a trauma patient, then you can start the process of everything from that day forward related to that accident. So again, it has to be in that area of the oral cavity, um, but this is an option. So one of my favorite trauma cases, I shouldn't say it that way because I'm no, never happy anyone gets hurt, but um, I have a patient that um, fell while walking and he hit his face on the bumper of a nearby car. Um, and he lost all of his anterior teeth in this. Um, he also broke his nose and, and had another fracture and had to have surgery. So he was referred to us by the surgeon. Uh, we were known in our community for billing medical insurance. And so they often referred their patients like that to us because they knew we could help them get um, medical benefits. So we billed the entire procedure to medical, but he ended up needing um, implant-supported dentures, both upper and lower. By the time it was all over with, there wasn't enough to restore. He didn't have enough posterior teeth that we could really do bridges or any other treatment. And so they paid for all um, upper and lower implant supported dentures for him. And that patient paid nothing, zero out of pocket, because he'd already met his deductible and his out of pocket max at the um, surgery center for all of his other complications. So, and then they continued to pay for his ongoing treatment too. Um, it took us time to get him there. We did have to do some pretty elaborate grafting and it took us a little time. And then after treatment, there was still a lot of adjustments on an implant supported denture and they paid for all of his follow-up. So myth number six, in order to build trauma to medical insurance, there must be a hospital or police report. This is absolutely not true. All that needs to happen is your patient needs to fill out an accident form. They just need to complete a form in your office, and, and we provide one to all of our customers, but it just says what exactly happened, where were you when it happened, what were you doing, where is the pain, you know, what, what condition was it in beforehand. I mean, just ask some real specific questions. It makes sure that you didn't have it happen at work. And make sure that it wasn't in a car. So they're asking a few, we're asking a few questions, um, but that's it. If we can write this down, we've just shown that there is a trauma or accident. The really great thing is there's no timely filing limitation from the date of injury. So the patient could have had that accident years ago and we can still open a medical billing case for an accident related dental procedure. So one thing that we do in our practice, and I'd encourage you all to do, is train your hygienist to just tweak their question just a little bit. And when the patient says, this upper right has been hurting me, have them say, what exactly happened? You will be so surprised how many patients were involved in some sort of accident, but they don't associate that as being relevant to you. They say, I don't know, it's been hurting for a few days. Well, how exactly did that happen? Well, you know, you know what, it really started I was at a baseball game and I, I, was, I was hit or my son elbowed me or my toddler reared their head back and headbutted me. And ever since I've had some lingering sensitivity in eight and nine, that's an accident. Um, really the only thing that won't be considered an accident is damage done to teeth while chewing because they consider that um, to be more of a dental issue because a healthy tooth doesn't break while chewing. So um, great opportunity there. Um, here's just an example of, of a trauma case. This happens to be a football player. I wanted just to show you how these codes work. So if you look on the right-hand side under diagnosis code, tooth number eight, you'll see that tooth number eight had irreversible pulpitis, was in pain due to trauma, was struck against or by an object while playing tackle football. 
that's what medical billing is all about. It's about telling the story about what happened for that patient in code format. So if you'll hear us in our courses talk about speaking their language, this is what we mean, is they want you to tell their story in code. You'll see that tooth number nine, same patient, same injury, has different diagnosis codes because number nine was lost, it wasn't restorable. So we have a partial loss of tooth, we have a fracture of a tooth, and struck by an object while playing tackle football. So uh, this just gives you an idea of what a trauma case would look like. We have to have an activity code. We have to tell them what happened. So your patient has to be pretty specific, um, and you'll be surprised how specific these codes get. Um, there's some pretty crazy ones out there. Um, any of you who are members of our Facebook group might periodically see us post some funny ones, but hit by a falling alligator or um, even the falling space um, spaceship. So some pretty strange things that are out there that we probably won't use much, but um, this is what that should look like. And then uh, fifth category, surgical and laser procedures. This is what most people think of when they think of medical billing, because they think of what oral surgeons do. Um, so the surgical procedures. So here is where we would bill for your surgical extractions, your third molars, your implants, your bone, your full mouth reconstructions, your full perio surgeries. You could also bill for anesthesia here. So um, really broad category um, that covers a lot of surgical procedures. So myth number seven, all surgical procedures are covered by medical insurance. That is absolutely not true. We have to prove medical necessity. So if a tooth is lost due to caries, it is far less likely that the medical insurance is going to pay for tooth replacement or even tooth extraction because they're saying that was something the patient had control over. So one rule of thumb is to say, was it within the patient's control? Did they lose the tooth? because they chose to not have oral hygiene? Did they lose the tooth because it fractured? Well, that's out of their control. Did they have an abscess and the tooth had to be extracted? That's, that's actually out of their um, control as well. So it's why was the tooth lost will determine if an implant is covered. The reason, the way that we'll prove if a bone graft is covered is, is there atrophy? That's it. So on bone grafting, it's one of my favorite places for you to start as well, is we know that bone's not being covered by dental in most circumstances, and the allowables are so low. But if you can show atrophy, which you are only grafting because of atrophy, you just have to tell them how advanced it is and which arch, and you can bill medical insurance for bone grafting. Okay? Um, so again, I'm not saying that all procedures in surgery can be billed to medical insurance. In fact, I'm telling you, single tooth implants are one of the hardest to get paid because usually medical conditions don't isolate themselves to only one tooth in the mouth. Uh, we'd usually see a more advanced um, defects if it was a medical condition. I can also say I've never seen a patient lose all of their teeth for, um, for, uh, because of a healthy reason. <laughs> so a healthy patient with no medical conditions and, and no um, um, comorbidities generally loses all their teeth. So all on four or implant supported dentures are a great opportunity. So here's an EOB for a, a, a single arch reconstruction. Um, they allowed 23,000. They paid 90% at $21,000. This is the type of procedure that your patient may not be able to say yes to because they can't afford it. And by billing medical insurance, we could potentially not only get them the treatment they need, increase our bottom line, so this is a great case for us, but we potentially save this patient from something far, far worse, right? If you took a full mouth reconstruction, there's, things are in pretty rough shape. So um, great opportunity here um, to take those bigger cases that patients can't afford and try to build medical for those. Here's a bone grafting one. Usually people get pretty big eyes when we um, talk about bone grafting allowables. This one happens to be 1,067 per site, not quadrant. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot higher than we get in dentistry, paid at 90%. I'm not suggesting that you all should go out and up your fees for bone, but just know that bone is a higher allowable procedure in medicine. And so in this case, they billed 1,067 and they allowed 1,067. So we don't know if they would have billed 2,000 if they would have allowed 2,000. So they'll never pay you more or allow more than you bill. But in this case, you know, $960 reimbursement, patient has $106 copay. 
we couldn't have done bone for cheaper in our practice, right? They'd pay at least four or five hundred dollars out of pocket if medical wasn't being billed. So great opportunity. And then third molar extractions. You guys are probably already seeing this. You're seeing um, dental insurances deny third molar extractions because they're saying they're dense, they're medical. So we're billing dental, we're getting a denial saying you must bill medical. People are saying, can you help me get a denial? And uh, we can then go back and rebuild dental. And so I'm gonna suggest you guys look at this a little differently. And instead of trying to get a den denial, let's try to get a payment. Let's see if we can get medical insurance to pay for these extractions. Now, completely bony extractions are almost always a covered benefit under medical policy. If you have um, a simple extraction on a third molar, that's a lot less likely to be covered. But here's just a few examples. You could bill for your office visit, your, your pano, your third molar extractions. Maybe there was a, a significant suture requirement because it was a really complicated extraction. You can charge for that additional time spent for closure. And you could bill for your sedation, your IV sedation. Now, you cannot bill for oral sedation. This is just for IV. And then here are some of your diagnosis codes. The teeth could, the impacted teeth could have had some abscess. There was pain. There was a disruption in tooth eruption, and then they were impacted. So that tells the story of why this is medical. And then here's one of my favorite EOBs um, that just was perfect. We, we sent it to, med, to dental. Dental came back and said, nope, bill to medical. We're, gonna, we're not paying for it. We billed it to medical. They paid 100%, $21.59. The patient paid zero. Not only was it the, third, the four impacted teeth, but it was also IV sedation. So that was paid here. Now, if we would have billed dental, not only would we not have gotten 2159 as an allowable because these are high fees, but also the patient would have been out of benefits and would have still owed to you, let's say at least $600, where in this case, the patient paid zero. So again, if you get those third molar denials from dental, I just would say, don't try to get a denial from, from medical, try to get a payment from medical if at all possible. Here's a, just another surgical procedure, an osteotomy, lots of follow-up. I just want to show you that we, don't, we can't control how fast the claim is processed, but every one of those lines on the right was us on the phone or corresponding with the insurance company, and it took us nearly two months to get this claim paid, but that was all on us. So that was our billing department, aging, fighting, responding, fighting. So if anybody thinks that uh, medical insurance is in the, in the industry of paying medical claims, you are mistaken. They are in the industry of not paying claims. And so we really had to fight pretty hard for this one. And then our last category is the systemic related. Now this is the most difficult. So this isn't where I suggest you start, but it's also the most rewarding. So this is where we bill for dental treatments that are directly related to either medication or medical conditions, or that the oral cavity or the health of the oral cavity is affecting certain health risks or health conditions. So for example, this would be if a patient uses tetracycline. This would be if a patient uses a medication that causes dry mouth, really common side effect to so many meds today is dry mouth. So um, if, they're, if they have dry mouth and they get root surface caries, we can bill medical for that. If a patient has um, diabetes or immune disorders, or if there's a, a patient that has GERD, um, or if a patient has epilepsy, they're contraindicated for removable appliances. So if you have an epileptic patient who needs a denture, you can bill medical potentially for the implant supported denture since they're contraindicated for removables. And then patients that are, are pregnant and other patients at high risk. So this is growing. Um, we all can really get excited about this category and, and I'm sure you all have a thousand examples of situations where you know that we're affecting health and vice versa, but this is the most challenging, So, uh, but the most rewarding. So I share this story all the time. Um, this is a patient, she was 16 when she first came into the practice. She suffers from ameliogenesis imperfecta. Her teeth were literally falling out in her hands. I don't know if any of you can imagine being 16 years old in high school and having that um, oral cavity and having no teeth. Um, but with, at the time when she came in, um, she was actually on suicide watch. Um, it, was, it was really devastating to her and her quality of life. And so um, the patients didn't have a lot of money. The parents couldn't have afforded the treatment if we weren't willing to bill medical insurance. Um, and we were able to restore her back to full function with implant-supported upper and lower dentures. Um, the patient paid nothing. The um, dental insurance, excuse me, the medical insurance um, 
along with some courtesy adjustments um, as, a, as a donated dentistry, cost this patient nothing. So I, I would say this is why we do it. Yes, we can increase your bottom line, and yes, we can get patients the care that they need that they might not otherwise be able to afford, but if each of you could help one patient in your entire time of practicing like this, then it would be worth it. So if you just, one of these in your entire practice life, not to mention if you really start looking, you're gonna probably find several of these types of situations a year, maybe even several a quarter, depending on the size of your practice. So um, if we can change her life, um, and I can help you guys understand that potential, then I think we've all done, done our job. So this is why we do it. So the medical billing process, um, first thing you do is get a copy of the insurance card. Then you're gonna call the insurance company to do a verification of benefits. This is a detailed benefit of your patient's benefits, and this is code specific. So the doctor first creates the treatment plan, we then do the VOB so that we know what the treatment is for that patient. Then we present the treatment, to the patient with those estimates. If the patient says yes to treatment, then we submit for pre-authorization and GAP request if necessary. I'll spend just one second on GAP, um, but GAP is just a, a loophole, and it says that if you are an out-of-network provider providing benefits to a patient or services to a patient that no other in-network provider in your area offers, they will give you a one-time exception because there's a gap in in-network coverage. So Included in our pre-authorization service is GAP request for every single patient. So every time you submit a pre-auth to us, you automatically get a GAP request as well. And all we're trying to do is get the best benefit for the patient. And we, most of you know that in-network benefits are better than out-of-network benefits. And so if we can get that in-network exception made, the patient will have lower deductibles and lower co-insurances. Then we wait for that pre-authorization to come back. Once it's approved, approved, then we complete the treatment and then we submit the claim. Really important that you understand that pre-authorization has to happen pre-treatment. So you can't go backwards and do a pre-authorization on a procedure you've already done. And it's also important that you know that you can't submit a claim to medical until that procedure is entirely complete. So we don't submit on impression or prep dates. We only submit on completion, delivery, or seat dates. And then we age that claim until paid. So that's just a high level. Um, so at our courses, we go over this in great detail, show you both how to do it yourself and how our services can help you get started with down this process. Um, last uh, myth is I can handwrite or mail in paper claims for most medical insurance companies. So you've already done the VOB, you've already done the pre-authorization, now it's time to submit your claim. A lot of offices and a lot of users on our Facebook group are doing handwritten or paper claims. And I, I need you to understand that that is something that is happening less and less and is only going to get worse for you. So 92% of all payers today only accept electronic claims. So this is no different than dentistry. We used to be able to submit paper claims. We used to be able to handwrite them. Now we can't. So in, in medicine, it's just taking them a little longer. So 92% of them will not accept paper claims. If you mail a paper claim, they will mail it back to you. So that's very frustrating. You had no idea that they didn't take it um, and you get it back in the mail. So you also have to have them be perfect. So if your X is too far out of the box, the, the scanner won't accept it and they'll reject it. You have to buy the actual HICFA form online, Amazon sells them, and print on them. It, ha it can't be duplicated, photocopied. It has to be the original. They can have no handwriting on them. And then just in general, they go through a much slower processing time. So electronic claims go through one department and paper claims go through another. So um, in general, offices are going to have to move away from paper claims. Um, and at our courses, we're starting to not even teach paper claim submissions unless there's a direct request because so few payers are accepting them. The other option for claim submission is to use a payer portal. So a lot of your payers, especially your big payers, will have portals and you can go online and check benefits and you can even submit claims. So you have to create an account for each payer. Not all payers have them, so this isn't 100% a solution, um, but nothing is preloaded or memorized. So you have to manually enter the diagnosis code with the dot and the zeros and everything in the right place. So the date of birth, the, the way it's saved, nothing is um, memorized. So if you create a claim for a patient and make a mistake, you have to start over. There's also no cross-coding built into these. So you don't say, 
I did this dental code and they show you what the equivalent is. So it's an option, um, but it also doesn't provide you any way to track or follow up. So be careful if you're using payers that you're at entering those somewhere in your software to track them in your practice management. And then the last option, and, and, and clearly the one that we recommend the most, and, um, is third-party billing. So this is a place where I think every practice really should consider outsourcing. Um, this is not your expertise. Um, you are not likely certified coders and billers. You likely haven't had a lot of time on the phone with medical insurance companies to learn the nuances of how to get what you need and get the right answers. So um, what we recommend is outsourcing. Um, it won't take away from your team. The cross-coding is already built in. You have certified coders and billings working for you. And then you get the support. So if claims aren't being paid timely or there is a denial, you have appeal options that are built in. And then all that follow-up and aging, that super time-consuming part. The claim submission is not the time-consuming part. It's the follow-up and aging that really takes a lot of time um, is outsourced. So you're not doing that. And then, of course, you pay a fee to use that service. So um, the nice thing about our, our billing solution is it's not there's no contract. So if you do sign up for Imagine Billing, you can use us for six months or a year or whatnot. And if at any time you are finding that you could do it yourself, you can turn off our service and you could go do your own medical billing. But what we find is most offices, even high volume offices, don't want to invest in the team to monitor those claims and do that aging and outsourcing still makes financial sense. Um, so I'd say why bill medical insurance? Because you can increase case acceptance by decreasing patient portion. You can leave dental benefits for future dental procedures. You can get paid for what you're doing, get paid for your PAs, get paid for your hygiene appointments, get paid for your CBCTs. Medical has no maximums or frequency limitations, so you don't have to fight to do the treatment that you want um, because there's no coverage. And then separate your practice from others. You heard me mention that the hospital referred to our practice. I can guarantee a patient who's had the opportunity to have medical billed from their dentist is far more likely to go talk about that and share that with their friends and family and say, hey, my fantastic dentist, they built my medical. Did you know that you could do that? That's an exciting thing. So both the medical community and your patients will really separate you from others by doing that. So with those points, I would say, why not? Why wouldn't you build medical insurance, at least for those procedures? So where do you start? We recommend you take a course. You have to learn to speak their language. Um, the ICD-10 codes I was talking about, there's 71,000 of them in the book. You need to figure out just not how to memorize them, because that's not how we recommend you do it, but how to understand them. And then you need to decide, how are you going to get your team trained? Are they going to go to a course? Are they going to have on-site training? How is the, your hygiene team going to be trained to document appropriately and to have the right conversations? Then you need to decide, how are you going to submit your claims? Are you going to do it yourself? Or are you going to use a third-party service? And then it's time to get started. Uh, we see a lot of patients, or excuse me, a lot of customers who have failure to launch. They get stuck. And, and we're saying just start. Start with your comb beam. Start with your bone graft. Start with a procedure not covered by dental. You do not have to be a master of all things medical billing to get started. So DebDent is a company. We offer soft education, um, team training, on-site, remote courses. I mean, everything you need for both sleep and medical billing. So we offer clinical training. We offer hygiene training. We offer team training. Um, we do that both in a classroom setting, then you can attend a course or we'll come to you and actually coach you and train you at your own practice. We also offer a, a number of services related to insurance and credentialing. So everything there is under DevDent. We have Imagine Sleep software. It's a cloud-based sleep software. So if you're really serious about implementing sleep in your practice, this is a software that handles all of your tracking, your referral letters, your medical billing, your patient communication, um, all your consent forms, all your screenings, and all your SOAP notes, just to name a few. So everything you need to be successful in sleep is inside this software. It is cloud-based, but it's also Dentrix connected. So if you are a Dentrix customer, um, you have a huge advantage of that connection. And then lastly, we have Imagine Billing. And that's the third-party billing service I've been mentioning. It is service and software. They come as a package. And we offer um, verification, pre-off, gap, claims, appeals, and then again, many, many other services related to insurance credentialing and fee analysis. Um, here's a flyer for our medical billing course. It's called uh, Start Medical Billing and Boost Case Acceptance. It's a two-day course, 13 CE credits. If you can get to a course during pre-registration, it's $4.99 per attendee. 
um, you two days of intense training on everything I skimmed over today. You get um, about a 150 page workbook. You get all those encounter forms, the accident reports, everything I mentioned today, um, all of that is included in that course. And then here's our Dental Sleep Medicine Simplified. This is a two day hands on course, both team and doctor, $4.99 during pre registration. And this one, uh, we actually, every um, provider gets to take a home sleep test home on night one, be tested, come back the next day, we review the results, and we actually demonstrate on four patients from start to finish. So they'll get to see screening, evaluation, testing, and treatment of four live patients throughout that course. Um, and then this is what the billing software looks like. So um, again, verification, pre-authorization claim, but you put in the dental code and our software cross codes it to medical for you. So all those codes I listed in our presentation, you don't have to memorize any of them. You don't need to have a cheat sheet all over your office to try to remember this. You put in the dental code and our software will tell you the equivalent cross code for every single dental code in dentistry. And then we take it a step further and we actually give you suggested or common diagnosis codes so you don't have to memorize those ICD-10 codes either. Um, that's it. So a um, couple things I want to make sure you guys are aware of. We do have a Facebook group, Medical Billing for Dental Practices hyphen Imagine Billing. It's, a, it's an open to the public group. It's a very active group. I'm sure a number of you are already participating. Lots of great questions and collaboration from dental offices. Um, you also are going to be getting a follow-up email at the conclusion of this um, webinar that will have links that you can schedule a demo if you'd like to see our software in, in action. You can see our entire course calendar, so you can see if there's a course that will fit your schedule and get started on either sleep or billing. Or you can schedule a call with one of our experts. And this is just um, a call to say, hey, uh, this is the type of practice I have, this is um, what I'm looking for, and is, is this a good fit? And we'll help you do that. So um, those are you're going to be at a follow-up email. You can always visit devdent.com as well. Now, I know we had some questions come in, um, and we are out of time. So um, if you have questions, you can continue, continue to post those in the chat box for the next 10 minutes or so. And then we will do our best to respond back to you personally, answering any questions you might have um, so that you can uh, hopefully get something out of this. We are doing routine webinars as well. So um, there will be a sleep webinar. Uh, well, there will be two sleep webinars and two billing webinars done a month from DevDen. So the topics will vary slightly. Um, we're going to be talking about implants and specifically implant billing. Uh, we're going to be talking about Medicare and, and how Medicare fits into this equation. Um, and then also just how to implement sleep into your practices. So if you're on our mailing list, you're getting these notifications. Um, if you're not, you can go add yourself to our mailing list at our website. And then we can keep you up to date on our webinar schedule. So uh, thank you very much. And please post your questions in the chat button if you have, or chat box if you have any.